Thank you. I mentioned FC Deutschland. Yeah, that, that collapsed that project, I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> in the, um, in the, um, so I'm not talking about the Eurozone instead. Um, no. What I would like to say is I have 20 minutes and I would like to explain. I mean, people always see, I look at me as a pessimist. I'm actually not, that's actually not a true, a true statement. I'm, I'm reasonably open about, about all, the, all the prospects. What I see, there are, a, I would think there are sort of three strands which, which, which I see ultimately tell me that this thing is unsustainable. It doesn't mean it will collapse. It means that something will have to change. It can collapse, but that you know, also certain conditions can change to make it work. But there are three things that, are, that I find ultimately unsustainable or that in their combination produce an unsustainable mix. Let me start off with the first one, which is banking. Um, the Eurozone has seen, uh, or Europe, Eurozone banks have seen a number of successive crises. Each of them would have been a very big, uh, um, a very big issue for them and a, a problem for its balance sheets. The first one was the U.S. mortgage crisis, which wasn't even a domestic one. But obviously, during that period, there was also bad debt accumulated through bad through bad lending in the housing sector, like as, as happened here in Ireland and in Spain. Um, so there were problems arising from that period. We've then had uh, you know, the beginnings of the Greek crisis. You know, we've seen, this has resulted in, in a restructuring of Greek debt. That was certainly a, a, a factor of problems for the, for the banks. Um, in cases like Germany, with, with decade, a decade of current large current account surpluses that were invested abroad, um, or shall we say capital account deficits that Germany had, uh, that Germany had to um, you know, digest. Um, those, uh, you know, we don't know exactly where all, this, where all these investments went, but I would assume that a large amount, we know it from some of the banks, were, were funded or were, were invested in, in securities with a very dubious, dubious pedigree. And you know, there are large hidden, hidden, hidden losses in those balance sheets in, uh, in the German banks. We know that the French banks are in, 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 some, in some difficulty more than what has generally been, um, been, been acknowledged. So you have this combination uh, of, of crises. We have Cyprus. We have, obviously, a recession. Normally, a, any recession is a problem for, for banking. Saying these are not just any little. This was a double-dip recession. We had the 2009 recession followed by yet another one and one in Spain, and that depends very much on the outlook, but it doesn't look, you know, it's gonna end that soon. It will, it will last for this entire year. So this accumulation, this accumulation of, of shocks and losses will have produced losses on balance sheet that would, be, that would not all be visible at this, mo at this moment. And you can make your estimates. We don't know what it is. The ECB will conduct what it calls a qu asset quality review in the, in the first quarter second quarter of next year. This asset quality review is meant to unearth some of, look at these balance sheets in some greater detail. Uh, but if you look globally, the Eurozone has 25, a balance sheet total Eurozone banks of about 25 trillion. You take out the central banks, that leaves you with 24 trillion. Get very rough, take or leave a trillion. It doesn't really matter, ultimately. If you're dealing at that scale, if five percent of that is underwater, which isn't an all that extreme estimate, then you come up to about a trillion, a trillion in in hidden losses. Now that doesn't mean that you need a capital of a trillion because some of those losses could be funded by existing capital, but it would probably, given that the European banks are in general not overcapitalized and with too generous buffers, you know, you would assume that a fairly significant part of that uh, would have to become be raised in new capital. Now, 5% is just a wild guess. It's a wild but conservative guess. You know, I've, I've seen this, an exercise in Slovenia where the central bank has actually looked at the banking system, and they came up with a number of 19% of the assets of Slovenia being underwater. Now, that may not be indicative of the average of the Eurozone. I would not, you know, we cannot extrapolate. But it can easily be that if you are in a country where where things went wrong in that period, things could, you know, there could be quite a, the, uh, the, the, the assets that are underwater could be quite, could be quite sizable. Um, so we're, li we're looking at, at, at a very large recapitalization need for the Eurozone banking system that I don't see, that the Eurozone is not gonna raise anytime soon. They're pre presenting a banking union. I will talk about the banking union in, 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 in a moment, but, um, the, uh, the, 
There is no realization among the countries. The Spain did an exercise of, uh, of an asset quality review. They invited outside consultants. They came up with a number ultimately that led to a recapitalization of 40 billion. The Spanish banking sector, I would have estimated the sum at least five times as much. But it seems to be the political, the way this works politically is that the governments don't want to recognize these losses because, because they want to maintain that they have a solid, maybe out of, out of pride or maybe even out of you know, recognizing a 200 billion loss would have reverberations on the government. If, if Spain had accept, accepted that its banking system were broke, well, Spain might, might already now be a full a candidate to be uh, for a, a European rescue program because it would not be able to fund itself. So, you know, we should not trust governments in general to, to be honest about these exercises. And in the way the Eurozone works and the way these stress tests have worked, this works through national regulators, through national supervisors. This is not a, a, a truly independent uh, uh, process. So my first conclusion is that we have a banking sector that is largely underwater. I don't see it's, it's likely to be fixed because the, the, the national interest will prevail over, the, over the, the common interest in fixing this banking sector. Um, and also in the realization that we don't have the institutions in place to fix the banking sector. That's, we, haven't, we, haven't, we haven't basically created the, you know, we don't have the trillion, basically. Uh, this is something which, which needs to be provided for and isn't being provided for. The second reason for my pessimism is the, you know, is the macroeconomic policies, uh, uh, in particular the way we have applied austerity. Now, some people say austerity may be over. It, it isn't really over. What we're seeing, Italy is a good example. It has applied a very significant austerity in 2012 and 2013. Um, but now the government comes in and says austerity is over. There's a tax they will, they will take back, but they will increase the other, another tax just to compensate, exactly compensate whatever is gained by, by, not, by, 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 by suspending one tax. Um, because the goal, the, the ultimate goal of a of a the nominal deficit to GDP target in Italy's case, 2.9 percent, is unchanged. So you know, if you call it austerity three months ago, it's the same policy. It's just a different distribution. And in the short run, it matters relatively little of whether your your tax is VAT or your tax is a housing tax. There are different implications in the longer run. There may be fairness implications, but. Uh, if you want to assess the impact of austerity on, on growth, it's, it's, it's not going to be the big difference if you, take, if you take the money away from people. It doesn't really matter from whom you take it away. The, the overall macroeconomic impact is the same. If you look at the economy of the Eurozone, it's often easier to look at the Eurozone as a single economy. If you look at it as sort of a series of, of states that are bound by some exchange rate regime, it becomes very complicated. But if you look at the, uh, the, you know, the economic literature, it's fairly clear about, about the impact of austerity in large closed economies. The Eurozone is a large closed economy with characteristic that's similar to that of the United States. And you know, since we all apply austerity, it's not applied at one country level and not anywhere else since everybody has the same policy because of the fiscal pact, because of the fiscal rules, everything we do is symmetric. Even Germany implies a, a degree of austerity at the moment. Um, so that combina the, this combination of policies means that the so-called fiscal multiple, in, in what I have to add, in the, in the presence of a zero interest rate, where we are in a liquidity trap, that, that the presence of, a, of, a, of an austerity policy means that it, the impact on growth is very significant. Technically, the multiplier is greater than one. Um, that means for each, for each um, you know, percent of austerity, you lose that much in growth because you take the money you take out of the economy is, is not compensated for by, by other policies. Normally, interest, rate, interest rates fall in response. The private sector could, could, could consume more or, or invest more, so they, the effect would be somewhat compensated. That is not the case at the moment. So if you apply austerity in a situation like that, um, you, get, you get a very significant impact of, on growth. That's what the economic literature would tell you, and it and it was denied in the eurozone that this would, would happen, but it happened. And exactly, you know, we have a, we have seen in the last in the last in the last year a an economic response that was entirely predicted and predictable that austerity would have that effect. Um, and while we are now loosening it a little bit, because in 2014 there won't be any net austerity applied at the eurozone level. 
though we're not taking it back. It's just a level and, and a level effect, so we're going to st stick to this. There will be additional austerity in the years 2015, 2016, when the new fiscal pact that everyone had signed kicks in because the new fiscal pact compels countries not just to keep their deficits low, but actually to repay debt uh, if their debt to GDP levels are over 60%, which is the case in most countries, so that a percentage of that excessive debt, a, a 20th of that excessive debt has to be repaid every year, basically me meaning that countries would have to run ex uh, fiscal surpluses simply to repay that debt. Now, people may hope that this, this might be suspended or reinterpreted, but that's what the fiscal pact says, and it would, require a, you know, it would require a fairly tight fiscal policy for the indefinite future. Um, if we, if we, um, I'm, I'm skeptical. What, what it tells me that, that even if I'm not sort of, even if I don't believe that, the, even if we believe we get out of the liquidity trap, and if we believe that things normalize, uh, in the global economy, it means that the, the, that the government will remain a restrictive influence on growth. It, you know, it will not be a positive influence. That, that's, a, that's a forecast I'm fairly certain, certain of making. If you combine that with my first observation, that we have a fairly restrictive environment for growth with a dysfunctional banking system that is unlikely to provide credit because banks that are underwater are not going to expand their asset base. They are restricting their asset base. We're seeing credit crunches in various parts of the Eurozone uh, in place. That means we, we're going to look at a, a decade very similar in some respects to that of Japan in the 1990s of low growth with sort of, as, as they called it, the zombie banks. These are large banks that are not, that are, that are there, but they can't really act. They can't really f fulfill the economic functions of a healthy banking sector, uh, sector but they're not, uh, they're not being wound down because governments are afraid of doing so, because they're of vested interest by politicians or, or other, other concerns. Um, uh, about the consequences of the, that such a policy has. So that scenario is already puts us sort of in a low growth uh, equi equilibrium. Now, what could potentially solve the situation would be a, a genuine banking union. And now we're coming to my third, my third category of, of issues why, why I'm, I'm skeptical. And I was briefly optimistic in the summer of last year when the European Council agreed the principle of a banking union, a fiscal union, in a sort of a long time scale. And I said, okay, it might not be fast enough, but at least they're going in the right direction. But what we're seeing today is the banking union is not, it, it's, it's still called a banking union, but it doesn't fulfill the economic functions of a banking union. You know, have the, the first agreement was to shift the supervisor for the large banks from the, the member states to the center. That is a, an important step, but it doesn't change just the fact that someone else supervises the banks. Does not, in the, you know, does not change any of the, the, the problem that we, that we just identified. Uh, the second step that was taken was a harmonization of resolution rules. That's very important because if you step into another country, you know, assume the ECB or whoever is going to be the, the new resolution authority came to Ireland, closed down a bank, obviously that had to be done under Irish laws. You know, there are insolvency laws, there are employment laws, there are tons of laws that are affected. So we need to... We need to harmonize those laws in order for this sort of cross-country resolution to, to happen. The third step would have to be a resolution authority. We have to create an authority that actually does this, that actually goes in to a bank on a Friday afternoon, merges it with another bank, closes it down, does, does something, you know, basically to, you know, uh, something that, that isn't normally done in Europe, um, which is like closing, closing down a bank that isn't profitable. If we believe that's going to happen, there needs to be a very strong uh, uh, authority that is backed by law. That is, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how they're going to pin this under, under the current legal system. The main debate in Brussels is about whether the European Commission should do this or whether there should be another authority. It seems to me that Germany, that's why the information wants to prevent absolutely that the Commission gets involved in this. So there's going to be a typical Brussels interinstitutional fight that we're, going to, that we're going to see in the next few weeks, and which kind of deflects our attention from the real issue, because it doesn't really matter who does it. The question is it, that it needs to get done. We need to, we need to resolve the banking sector if we feel there is a billion, a trillion of unresolved uh, losses in the system. It needs, the job needs to be done. Um, and obviously, there needs to be a fund to do it. And the moment the fund that uh, the finance ministers are discussing is, has an order of 50 to 70 billion, probably at the, even at the lower end of that range, 
um, and that is not going to be enough. That's not going to be enough to uh, you know to deal with the fundamental uh, issues. And because the fund is lower than, than the needs, what I suspect will happen is that the needs will not be fully recognised. Uh, this is what we've seen in Spain. There, is a, there was clearly a, a banking system that's underwater. We see the bad news coming out in sort of in sort of trickle terms at the moment. We see you know, every day there's some some bad news about banks, some unresolved issues. Um, and now the government admits that the recapitalization has to be a little higher. You know, and that was already you know, an exercise that was you know, this, this exercise. They, they, they had an independent quality review. They looked at all the balance sheet. They came up with a number. Then they did all sorts of manipulations. And they came up with a number of 40 billion in, in, U, in US. I expect something similar to happen on the Eurozone. They will probably come up with a number, with a number of 100 billion or 200 billion in terms of new capital. Uh, that to be shared between the government and the ESM, some some kind of coordination and and bail in through, through, through shareholders, but it won't it won't exceed that level. So you know the, the shareholders, bondholders, depositors will get bailed in in some cases. Governments will co-fund it. The ESM will probably spend its 50 to 70 billion budget on it. So we're probably looking at a at something in the low three figures, and that's not gonna that's not gonna be it's not gonna be sufficient. So th this banking union is not going to resolve the eurozone banking crisis, um, and then you're, you're in a situation that can potentially last very long. We can be in a situation that you know that can last a decade. You know, at the end of which it, the eurozone can continue to live, and it doesn't mean it doesn't even forcibly say it's going to break down. It's dysfunctional, but it doesn't mean it's going to break down because a breakdown would require would assume that whoever leaves it would perceive it to be in a better position by leaving it. That's not necessarily the case. We've seen Greece, even the Greeks, who, who, you know, who, who I cannot see their future in the Eurozone, in, in, you know, even, even, after, even, even starting today, having gone through what they did, I still see it's not, it's not, it is not working. Uh, but even Greece is not going to leave. Even, not, even the government there, with all its unpopular measures, it still has a majority in the, in the opinion polls. So you know, it's going to take quite a lot for a country to conclude that it, it's better off outside the Eurozone with all the political risks, you know, because there's always the possibility that you might have to leave the EU. It depends on the, you know, the legal interpretation of the day, whether that is necessary or not. Um, but there's certainly a risk about countries, and then, unless it is a big country, uh, you know, I would assume most small countries would be kind of intimidated to, to even try this experiment. So this thing could, could last long, but the worst outcome is not necessarily a breakup. The worst uh, outcome could be a survival under a sort of a permanent crisis, uh, you know, infestation of social unrest, high unemployment, uh, you know, leading to a point in some kind of in the future where, where, where there may be sort of a, a violent social eruption. An alternative scenario would be a, a change in policy. It's well possible. Not, I can't exclude that Germany at one point and other northern countries say, "This isn't working for us. We need to really change it." And you know, let's do this. We denied the we, we denied the need for a euro bond, but now we've had you know the crisis now in year number fifteen. It's probably time to realize that it probably our crisis resolution policy haven't been all that successful. Let's do what we should have done fifteen years ago and go for it. I can't exclude it. I think it's unlikely, given the way the debate has been going in, 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 in the northern European countries, um, but, uh, who are kind of conflicted because they want the euro to survive. There is no majority for a break of, of the euro. If you look at the opinion polls, they really want it, but they don't want to do the things that are necessary for it to survive. So it's interesting how they resolve their own, their own internal conflict, and which is also part to do with, the, with their own narrative, crisis narratives. Now, I mean, if, if you talk to the average German, the, uh, the, the people would say that the crisis is because the governments have been irresponsible, which doesn't really explain what happened in Spain, doesn't explain what happened in Ireland. Uh, it doesn't really explain much. Even Italy cannot be explained by that. Greece could be explained by that. But that's, uh, you know, so the crisis narratives are very much part of the way this, the, how these sort of, this contradictory set of views has been, uh, has, been, has, been, has been formed. So I'm not making predictions about the Eurozone, but I'm just saying it's unsustainable. And you know, as a famous American economist or economic advisor once said, what is unsustainable will stop one day. It's just we don't know what will stop, what element will stop. And I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you.